What are we going to do as a church? Our souls need to wake up. We need to respond to the gospel of Jesus. He said, go into the world. We don't want to deal with reality, Christian. We don't even want to deal with reality even though we've been saved from this place. I'm calling on you today in the name of Jesus to rise up to the call of God. Christ is coming back soon. If I start telling people about hell, I might just scare them off. Where are you going to scare them off to? Hell number two? People stop and think about it. If hell really exists, and it does, I didn't say that Jesus did. Then don't you think people need to know about it? Can't you at least give them a fighting chance? Are you just going to sit there and let them burn? Are we ready? <laughs> All right. So for those that don't know, I am not Pastor Billy, and my name is Chris Taylor, and the message that we're going to do today has to deal with what God loves and what he hates. So before that, let's go to prayer. Dear Lord, I just ask you, as we come before your throne, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would reach the hearts that this message needs to reach, Lord God. For anyone that needs to rededicate their life or that needs salvation, Lord God. Move your spirit, Lord God, on those that need you the most, Lord God, so that this message can reach far and wide and people can leave and go out into this world and declare your name. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so i got a question. Have you ever felt inadequate while serving God? Have you ever felt like he's distant from you in the time that you need him the most? Do you feel like the world is falling apart while you feel a sense of apprehension when unbelievers ask you to give a defense for your faith? We all have felt these things from time and time as we go through our life. Could it be that we have strayed away from his will and fell in love with the things of this world? Could it be that we love what God hates? And we've grown insensitive to his nudging to turn around. Could it be that some of our prayers are unanswered because of unconfessed sin? In today's study, we'll explore some of these issues while dealing with what the Bible says about what God detests. It's called How to Hate What God Hates. Please stand as we read God's holy word. We're going to go to Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. If you're ready. It says, These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that are swift to running into mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he so that soweth discord among the brethren. You may be seated. Sin was passed down through the seed of Adam. It's in our DNA. We can't deny that. God has a redemptive plan for mankind that started being revealed through Abraham. God made a people from the seed of Abraham, and Abraham's faith was counted for righteousness. As we fast forward, we see the people of God in Egypt under bondage. Then through the power of God, Aaron and Moses were able to liberate the Israelites from Egypt on a mission towards the promised land. On this mission is where God gave the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments exposed the nature of man through the hands of Almighty God. But before this expose, the people who knew that God was with them day and night got anxious because Moses was on the Mount of Sinai for a long period of time in the presence of God. Ultimately, they turned to making a golden calf, an idol. They threw a big party um, as they honored the symbol of Baal, the calf was made from their own possessions. God's wrath was kindled against his people so much that he was ready to extinguish the lot of them. Moses interceded, and God turned away his anger. 
Now, can you imagine being there at the time and also having God there with you and the other people he brought out of Egypt? Can you imagine having a nature that wanted to go back to the place of spiritual bondage or slavery? This is even after the people saw the miracle of God, God's power being displayed by the parting of the Red Sea. Time and time again, through the centuries, the Israelites committed spiritual adultery, even when God sent his minor and major prophets to correct all sorts of injustices against himself. An important thing to remember is that they were supposed to be the sign to the nations around them of how to be uh, godly, to serve God. We were supposed, they were supposed to be separate, that's a key, and not to serve other gods. After all, that's the first commandment. Some of, some of us might say, I wish I could have been there. I would have never done that. In all truth, that's a position of arrogance and presumptuousness. Even though we might mean well with these statements, these thoughts are based on the times that we're living in and the fact that we have a Holy Spirit living in us in this church age. Do we see any similarities that mirror this behavior? Do we justify some of this behavior by hiding behind the freedom that we have in Christ? Or the power of grace? We'll get to some of that, those details in a minute. The first thing I want to point out is this is not legalism. Legalism is defined as strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or to a religious or moral code. There are many forms of legalism, by the way. It kind of, kind of never ending, depending on your um, personality type and what you're convicted by. Uh, some of these are, you can heal, you can't heal, heal people on the Sabbath. This is what the Pharisees told Jesus. You can't watch any TV because the devil uses it to, as a tool to desensitize our culture to evil. Now, this is true, but TV in and of itself is not evil. It's just a mechanism. Women can't wear makeup in the church because it accentuates their beauty. They must wear dresses, no pants, uh, no earrings allowed, and so on. And personally, one might say, I go the speed limit all the time because I'm obeying God, but when there's a storm on the highway, this same person that goes 65, mile, 65 miles per hour all the time is now going too fast, simply because the rest of the traffic needs to go 25 miles per hour to avoid accidents in the torrential downpour. So basically, this person just serving their own pride. Then the, the last one here is, you can't go to the mall because it's secular or an amusement park, or X, Y, Z, you put it there. We live in a world that's fallen, and we can't put strict rules on each other based on our own convictions. Now, with that defined, I want to point out that there is a distinction between the holy and the profane, darkness and light. Sounds like common sense, right? How many people knowingly or unknowingly have conformed to certain ideals and practices that are detestable to God? Can you be forgiven? Absolutely. But we must be mindful of the consequences that stick to us like glue because of our participation in these particular actions. Some of these consequences could lead to death, like Ananias and Sapphira, who got taken out by God, they're Christians, for lying to the Holy Spirit. Other consequences are just a physical consequence, even though it's still serious. For instance, the person that was fornicating in the Corinthian church with his stepmother. Paul said his body will get handed over to Satan, but that he would see heaven. So he's a Christian, but he's doing these things that God detests. There's also psychological and emotional consequences that remain deep in our memory banks. The memories that sometimes haunts us through our lives because we didn't consider our actions before we took part or observed for hours the wickedness of this world as we 
diligently worked hard to pay for a sewage pipe of sin through entertainment just to be amused. We'll explore that the next, in the next uh, presentation. Sin deteriorates our moral character, and if we continue not to heed the nudging of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we end up in pitfalls that, in retrospect, may have you wondering, how did I do this, or how did I do that? I go through that a lot of times when I look back on my life. God warns us in distinct and sometimes unique ways. Unfortunately, we sometimes ignore the warnings and run headlong into sin for the purpose of pleasure or power. Sometimes we even mistake sin and look at it as if we have a zeal for doing God's work and we mistake sin for God's will. Later we find out the bitter truth that it was our will all along and not the will of God. Here's a good example. I saw a video once where a group of legalistic street preachers said to a woman that was walking down the street with her boyfriend or husband that she was a whore for wearing the attire that she was wearing. That wasn't the spirit of love talking, but the spirit of pride and hypocrisy. We all have some sort of beam sticking out of our eye, like Jesus said. Now, in this next video, we'll give you a good representation of some bad legalism. All legalism is bad, but you don't want to eat. That's right. You so-called Christian-looking whores. Yes, sir. Trumping in some church, flapping your ankle chains around, all on the choir, breasts hanging out, lips all red, nails painted red, purple, blue, green, long like bird claws, all this fake hair, breast implants, toenails painted with little fake diamonds in it. Your toes ain't richer. You're nothing but a prostitute. Amen. Amen. Yeah, man. Yeah. Go, ahead, go to church now. Go to church. Right. Got nothing but a singing hoe, a shouting That's hoe, right. an yeah. organ playing hoe, yeah. a choir director hoe. Yeah. Hey, hey, preacher, preacher, preacher. If what I just said describe your wife, you're married to a hoe. Yeah. Yeah. Am I right, I said? Yeah. Talk to me. Street looking like a prostitute, oh, yeah. no. 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 and you a holy woman, yeah. Amen. Amen. or claim you's a Christian, Amen. Christian with skin tight pants, Amen. showing the very shape of your birth canal, going to some church with the shape of your birth canal exposed and public and jeans all up the back side of your behind right. carrying a bible that's right going to church that's right yes sir so <laughs> how many of you would have got up and left right and you see there that the women in the audience are just like hey man i don't think that's the right approach now <laughs> in John 3, 17 through 21, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the condemnation. That light came into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hath the light. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, and his deeds may be made manifest, that they were wrought or forged in God. As you can see, God will do the condemning. So we must judge without being hypocrites or by appearance. 
We can reach more people by showing the love of Christ, then warning about the consequences of sin, which is hell and his coming judgment. If I tell a drunkard that he is drunk, I haven't enlightened him to the truth of the cross. I've just reflected what he already knows. We're living in days of distress. Even though some of our daily lives seem normal, we are getting closer and closer to the return of our King, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The evidence is thrown in front of us daily, even to the point that even the unsaved are saying these are days of biblical times. Now, in this time, now it's time to reach the Lord, the lost. Now it's time to shine your light, to teach the truth about Jesus instead of worrying so much about the cares of this world. When Jesus comes to bring total peace to this planet, none of this will matter. Not the next X-Men movie, not the next Pokemon game, the World Series, the Super Bowl. It will be an existence that we can't imagine right now because we don't have our new bodies. We're not in the Manilium Kingdom yet. We have u- we're used to being sick and slowly dying, but the hope that we long for is marching closer. But for the lost, hell is getting closer as well. The great tribulation is getting closer. Every second that time passes, the world seems like it's going insane. But that means that God's plan is unfolding. The Lord is at the door, and the world has no hope outside Jesus. They will accept the counterfeit, the Antichrist, that will declare himself as God in the soon-to-be-built third temple in Jerusalem. How many people do we imagine are going to hell every single day? 1,000? 20,000? 100,000? How many of these people do we consider even every day as we go into the world? Do we consider our actions? Do we consider sharing Jesus um, when his spirit prompts us? Are we sharing with family members, co-workers, total strangers? Are we praying for those that we have rejected, sorry, that have rejected us? The same ones that seem like the gospel has no effect. The fact is, if we are not sharing our faith, then we need God to soften our hearts so that we can love, love more. We need more empathy because this world um, trains us to grow callous. Do you remember where you came from? We were enemies of God until he stirred our hearts through the gospel to repent. We made the mental U-turn, changed our minds towards the only way to eternal life, Jesus. Callousness doesn't come from the Spirit of God because it would betray his very nature. Here's a quote from one of our great Bible teachers of our time, Chuck Missler. Our sensitivity to sin is callous because of our culture and our attitudes, basically our attitudes towards sin. Our society has turned into one with many gray areas. Moral relativism is killing a lot of people and their souls are just lost. Even in the church where some people's lives seem to be indistinguishable from the world, This is nothing new in Christianity. The Laodicean church, for example, Jesus loved them and gave them a sharp rebuke. So they were saved. Spewing them out of his mouth didn't mean they weren't saved. Or they lost their salvation or something like that. He says, who I love, I chasten. The American culture and the rest of the world has taken a turn on a road that has been coming for a long time. Like a frog in a pot of boiling water. This was all written in the Holy Book of God, of course. Stop hoping for the good old days to return. They just won't. Christ is coming back soon. He is our hope, not, our politi- not, not a political leader, not the peace that mankind is searching for, not even the love of a significant other. Jesus said, speaking to the disciples, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give, you, give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. There's a lot of stuff going on in this world that we can be afraid of. Things dealing with tech and um, police uh, 
violence or uh, surveillance and all these things that we see coming about on this planet, uh, persecution of Christians, we can be afraid of a lot of things. But God said, have peace. The Holy Bible says that there is nothing new under the sun. It also gives a very detailed roadmap to the future things and how the world will be uh, um, ushered into the worst time in the history of mankind. It only gets better when we get raptured or if we die and go to be with him. Ultimately, when he returns, we will have an experience uh, in a new way of existence and also a special place in his kingdom. We need to always remember his promises in the context of the church, not the promises that are made exclusively to Israel. Paul says in, in Colossians 3, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, if ye, be, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on what? The things above. Not the things of this earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, or our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. We'll come back with Christ. What a lovely expression of how God wants us to think and be assured. We should rejoice in this. There's a phrase that I hear from time to time. People are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I get the meaning, but I have, have to disagree because the Holy Bible says opposite. Of course, if, we focus, uh, if our focus is all wrong, if, we have a heavenly mind, if we're heavenly minded, we will also be earthly good, reaching the loss and not getting ourselves into the holes of corruption. If we have the mind of Christ and are meditating on the things that he tells us to, the more good deeds we will be able to accomplish through his spirit while serving him on earth. I believe that makes a lot of sense, don't you? Paul also tells the audience to put to death or hate, sorry, to hate the deeds of the flesh. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passions, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, coming out of your mouth, or filthy language out of your mouth. Basically, we shouldn't be cursing or, you know, filthy language is filthy language, no matter how much we try to clean it up, saying different substitutes for those words. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Have we really put off the old man? And have put on the new man who is renewed in, not, in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. So in other words, no Christian should be a racist. None. We'll get back to that issue in the next presentation. So <laughs> with that introduction, <laughs> I'd like to point out some serious issues dealing with what God hates. Yes, he is the only true God of love, he is the embodiment of unconditional love, the love that many of us still can't imagine, but we've felt a fraction of it, and we want more. But the fact of the matter is God hates. He hates sin. He hates what is detestable, and furthermore, what's an abomination. God has put some high standards in place, standards that we can strive for because we aren't enslaved to sin anymore. Freedom came with the death and resurrection of Jesus, the truth has set us free. Amen? 
There are many things that we are sensitive to. We are sensitive to light if we have an eye disease, sensitive to political conversation, sensitive to, sensitive to secondary biblical topics. Pastor Billy is even sensitive to chicken, right? <laughs> We're even sensitive to different levels of truth. But the one thing that, se- but that some, some of us are not sensitive to as Christians is sin. Sometimes we hide behind the principle of God's grace in this church age. At other times, we hide behind what's called the freedom that we have in Christ. But that freedom isn't freedom to sin and live it up so that the world can be placated or hide our light so that the world doesn't perceive us as Bible thumpers, Jesus freaks, you name it. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We think we know ourselves, but we don't. Sometimes we get in a situation that we say we'll never do, and we still do it. That's the heart. Take a look at this heart. That's a heart, figuratively, how it would look without regeneration from Jesus Christ. God begins to mold this malleable heart into something that reflects his character. A good, uh, sorry, as God continues to sanctify us, the illustration might look like this. Something closer to its natural state, something closer to the heart of God. This is not about what I like, what I love, my opinions about anything. It's about absolutes in the word of God that many people want to make ambiguous, gray in the areas, and abusing his word and his character. Something that I don't recommend. It's it's about the heart of God and what he demands from his ambassadors. We are his representatives here on earth. So whatever we do out there, it says this is what God do or this is what he approves of on and on. We are his servants. He even calls us friends. We are his disciples. Disciples mean disciplined learners. Are we getting to his, into his word every day? Are we being disciplined to follow him? Are we getting disciplined in the pursuit of searching out his heart, the heart that's revealed through his word? Let's start with the fruit of the Spirit. Our heart should, should start showing evidence of God's fruit if we're born again. Fruit that the Holy Spirit produces with its different, different attributes. These aspects are recorded in his holy word. Galatians 5, 22 through 24. Uh, but this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long sufferings or patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness temperance or self-control against such there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust notice it's not saying that God has crucified your flesh say we crucify our flesh of course that comes through his power but it, Paul is telling us that we have that power through Christ to crucify our flesh the things that we struggle with all the time, whether it's our mouth or a dirty thought or whatever, we need to cast those imaginations down. As we crucify the flesh, <clears throat> are we crucifying the flesh? Are we producing good fruit? The world makes most of these attributes look corny. Our entertainment gives us the anti-hero or the amoral person, the feminist uh, that uh, positions herself against anything manly, especially his leadership the blasphemer, and so on, and so on, and so on. Our heroes of today are antichrist in spirit, and we love them. In contrast, Paul makes a clear distinction before giving the nature of the fruit. Galatians 5, 16 through 21. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if you, if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. 
Now the work of the flesh, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. We see a pattern here. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. We got a lot of entertainment teaching us how to be witches. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. We need to hate heresies out there. We got the Word of Faith movement, uh, the... Um, What's the one? New Apostolic Reformation. All sorts of things I could point out. All these heresies that are out there. Envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such a, such a like. So it's clear that none of these things we should be doing. And it says, of which I tell you before, and I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not my words. This is from the Bible. Ephesians 5, 1 through 11. Be ye therefore followers of God and as their children, and walk in love. We need to love more. As Christ also hath loved us, and hath forgiven, sorry, hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor, but fornication and all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you. We are representing Christ as becoming saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient. A lot of us are, I can only speak from my experience and what I've seen around. A lot of us are, especially as men, are caught in this juvenile mindset. We laugh at everything. Everything's not funny, you know, and we bring this into our 30s and 40s, and we just don't know how to be men, how to grow up. <laughs> and, and so he says, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather given uh, of thanks, right? We need to be thanking God. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Sometimes we need to be truthful to ourselves, who we really are. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And when we go before God, we need to confess our sins. We need to uh, examine ourselves and have him examine us. There's been times I thought I was all good. God showed me different. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose or reprove them. I do a lot of exposing on, <laughs> on the radio. Um, and people don't, some people appreciate it and others are like, oh, don't take away my childhood or whatever. You know? As you can see, God has shown through his apostles to the audience of the time and now that there is supposed to be a contrast. Some of these changes, dare I say, should come immediately, but a lot of us go through years of saying, God's working on me, or I'm a work in progress, or we're all sinners. Did you know that we're counted as saints? Here's another. I can't wait to get back to where I used to be with God. We say it, but don't make an enough effort. The cares of this world keep us stagnated. Sometimes we use these statements to brush off the fact that we should have deep conviction in our hearts for falling short. Yes, we all fall, fall short many times, but God has given us power through the Holy Spirit grace and the process of sanctification to overcome the sins of the flesh so that we can walk as holy people, peculiar people, people that even the Jews would envy, the kind of people that makes an unbeliever wonder, what's so special about that person? 
instead of this. If that person's a Christian, then I don't want to be like them because they act just like me and do the same things I do. Christianity must not work for them. Shine your light, Christian. The, the world sometimes looks at Christians like we're born saved. We know that's not true, but the world is always watching and always looking for the best to flow from us. Some are looking to prove that we will fall, and sometimes we do. The problem is the power to do good, or which that, that's what's righteous, comes from Jesus, not us. We are not righteous on our own, and they need to know that and see the best examples. The next offense that uh, we should hate deals with pride. We hear a lot of, about pride now, nowadays, and it's, just, and it's not just being promoted by the far left or the homosexuals. We display a proud look in many ways, but here's one. Unforgiveness. Many of us deal with this sin. Either we refuse to forgive for a myriad of reasons, or we have dealt with people that refuse to forgive us. In both cases, we need to take it to the Lord in selfless prayer. Sometimes we need to tackle the subject man to man, or woman to woman, or whatever combination that fits the matter. It might go something like this. How have I offended you? Or... Do you have a misunderstanding? Because I'm confused. <laughs> or, of course, in a loving matter. But there's also these words. I've offended you. I'm sorry. Two of the hardest words for people to say nowadays. I'm sorry. We need to follow the command of Jesus to forgive like the Father has forgiven us. Wives, husbands, friends, family, co-workers, strangers, it doesn't matter because we end up walking in sin and being eroded by the soul-eating disease of unforgiveness. Maybe some of our prayers aren't being answered because of this issue. It sours our hearts, while the other person is probably not giving you a second thought. Sometimes they do, with extreme bitterness. But God says, reconcile your differences and live peaceably. Put away your bitterness and forgive one another. What does scripture say? Let's take a look. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Then Colossians 3, 12 through 16. Put on therefore as the elect of God... Holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, we shouldn't be walking around sulking or angry carrying bitterness and acting out what's in our flesh, God hates it. Love what God loves and hate what God hates. It might just make you a happier person. Communication is key to solving these issues. Communicating with the Lord, confessing our sins, and again, communicating with the person that you have a problem with. Stop being petty. We are, all, we are in a spiritual war, and unforgiveness is a distraction to the task of, uh, ahead of us. Sometimes the unforgiving heart can lead to gossip or sowing discard. As we re read, <clears throat> this is also an abomination to the Lord. If any of us are caught up in this, stop it right away. Repent and seek forgiveness. 
I wasn't always a happy person who was content with life or walking in forgiveness. God has shown me to uh, give, he showed me to, and gave me a desire to love. He changed me like he's changed most of you. Make his peace rule in your heart. Love one another. Have empathy. You don't know what the person has gone, going on in their head or their hearts. A lot of people have it worse than you. Sometimes they're acting on that situation. It could be a death of a loved one, finances, a health problem. Someone could have offended them and they carried all the way to church or somewhere else. We don't see it, but God sees it all. He knows all of our burdens. And he's saying, stop being consumed with self. Stop being consumed with self. Strive to be holy. Holiness is how we learn how to hate what God hates. We are called to be holy. First Peter 1, 13 through 16, he's speaking to an audience of Jewish Christians. He said, therefore, preparing your hearts, sorry, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Sorry. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We are serving God. And be not conformed to this world, but ye tr be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what, it, <clears throat> what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We always wonder what the will of God is. That's it right there, among other things. Most of our entertainment and secular friends encourage us to live contrary to the word of God. But God laid everything out for us in, in a book that the world tells us is old and musty and written by men. The contradiction is the world trusts books like science books, history books, and all that. And prophecies that are written by and given by men. But the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit and Spirit written by God himself through men. That's the difference. They need, a, they need an encounter with Jesus. He is the truth. He is the living word. The book of Revelation records that the four beasts in heaven are declaring his holiness day and night. Here's a reference. And the four beasts had every uh, sorry. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, "Holy, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come." And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne with, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders, which is a picture of the church, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure thy, they are and were created. We were created to give God pleasure. But sin, you know, interrupted some of that. And now that we are able to have a relationship, he takes pleasure in us. Do you know that, that the angels actually study what we do here? Isn't it a privilege that we can strive to be like him? 
As we focus on Jesus, we become more like him through his righteousness and spirit. What he did on the cross, it sets us free. Paul gave the church of Corinth some words of being separate from the surroundings, the environment that were contrary to uh, living holy. Now, this doesn't mean because, uh, th- that doesn't mean that you become a hermit or totally alienate yourself from society. But here it goes. <clears throat> Second Corinthians six fourteen through 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or a wicked person, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols, for ye are the temple of the living God, As God had said, I will dwell with them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Change is not easy. Sin was first found in Lucifer. He had to suffer the consequences. Change had to happen. He got thrown out of heaven, him and the rest of his um, followers. But for Satan, there's no redemption. His destiny is sealed in the lake of fire, along with the false prophet and everybody else that's wicked and unredeemed. Adam and Eve disobeyed God's law. They tried to cover themselves up with their own ingenuity. But God, in his love and righteousness, pushed them, I'm sorry, punished them and put on new clothing on his children. He even, uh, through, uh, sorry, <laughs> even through the natural status of creation, it changed. Natural status of creation changed. Everything became cursed, and we've been witnessing this change for thousands of years. But God had a plan. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice for the sin of mankind, that changed everything. Now we have a chance to restore that relationship and gain eternal life. This change isn't difficult if you accept it. There's more change coming. The Millennium Kingdom, where basically it'd be like peace on earth. The real peace, not the Antichrist peace. Judgment for the lost. If you're a part of the first resurrection, you're blessed. If you're a part of the second resurrection, you're damned. Then we have the new heavens and a new earth. We have new Jerusalem coming down and we're going to live with God. I hope to see you there. That's the end of my presentation. Let's go before the Lord. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we just um, thank you for carrying me through this presentation and pushing your words out to the hearts that need it, Lord God. As we said before, change is not easy, but we all need it. We all need it in different areas in our life that just aren't refined to your will, Lord God. So we ask that as we go out into this world, Lord God, that we show more love, that you give us the ability to love more, Lord God, as we continue to live for you. And for those that aren't saved, I plead with you today to accept his gift. Time is short. And we see all of the signs coming upon us. We're all sinners, and we need someone to rectify that. And that his name is Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been. It can all be wiped away easily. He died on the cross. He came down from heaven, died on the cross for you, shed his blood for you, rose on the third day. 
And he's the only one that's done that. No other so-called gods throughout history has ever resurrected and given us eternal life. The gospel is the good news, the good news about what Jesus Christ did. The road, there's a wide road and a narrow road, and the wide road is the road that everyone is going down. The narrow road is the one you need to choose today. So if God is moving on your heart, he just asks you to reply, to accept what he's doing in your life, in your heart right now. And for those of us that need rededication of our lives, to walk straight away with God, I just ask you to heed to that calling as well. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, hi, this is Billy Crone of Get a Life Ministries, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, let me ask you one final question. Are you sure that if you were to die today that you go to heaven and not hell? Now, before you answer that, let me uh, share with you a couple things that the Bible says. The Bible says that God is holy and that we are not. And the wages of our sin or unholiness is death. We don't deserve to go to heaven when we die. We deserve to go down. We deserve to go to hell. Now, to make matters worse, we don't even want to admit this problem that we have, that we're separated from God not only now, but we're going to be separated from Him for all eternity in a place called hell. We, we, we don't even want to admit that. So, once again, out of love, God gives us what's called the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were God's x-ray, if you will, divine x-ray to, to get us to admit the problem that we have inside that's separating us from Him. Let, let, let's take a look at a few of those of God's divine x-ray. For instance, if you think that you're worthy on your own, you don't need a Savior, uh, you're going to get to heaven all by yourself, then let's take a look at God's test there, uh, the, the Ten Commandments. The ninth one says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. Uh, how many of you have ever told a lie before? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, if you didn't raise your hand, you just told one. But folks, we've all done that. That makes us a liar. The Ten Commandments, God's x-ray, showing us that we have sin that's separating us from Him. We're not holy and perfect like Him. The Fifth Commandment says this, You shall not steal. Don't ever once take anything without permission. How many of you have ever done that? Well, if we're not going to tell another lie, we, we should all admit that as well. Well, that makes us a thief now. The Bible says that God is so holy, uh, even His name is holy. And that's why the Ten Commandments says, You shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And if we're honest again, folks, hey, a lot of us, how many of us have used the blessed name of Jesus Christ? The only name, the Bible says, under heaven that men might be saved. We've now turned it into a common cuss word, if you can believe that. The Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. The Bible also says, hey, show, you want to show God you're so perfect, you have no sin? Then don't ever once commit adultery. And you might say, well, I, I've never done that. Really? Jesus lays the standard before us. God looks at the heart. Man looks on the outside. Jesus said, if you ever looked with lust in your eye at another person, you've committed adultery in your heart. That's His holy standard. One more. The Bible says, okay, you think you're so good? Uh, then don't ever once commit murder. You shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I, at least I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible again says that the sin of hatred, wishing someone was uh, dead, is akin to the sin of murder. It's just, if you will, you pull the trigger in your heart. So, so, so how are you doing? That's just five out of ten of God's divine x-ray, by the way, uh, showing us the problem. How are you doing? Not if, but when your time comes, we're all going to stand before God. You will be forced to admit what He already knows. Hey, God, let me in. Let me in. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a liar. I'm a, I'm a thief. I'm a, a, a blasphemer, an adulterer, and a murderer. And the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You're not headed to heaven. In that state, you're headed to hell. But here's the good news. God said if we would just admit this, number one, then He could fix it. And it gets fixed only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6, He says, I am the way, the life, and the truth, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Why? Because only Jesus lived the perfect life in our place. And Jesus died on the cross. He took the death penalty in our place so that we could be set free. And since we weren't there, and since it's a gift and we can't earn it, we have to receive that wonderful gift by faith. And the Bible says God will pardon us for our crimes, our sins, against Him. And you could actually see this analogy working uh, in the natural, in the normal world. Uh, we see this actually uh, in the courtroom. 
For instance, if a person is guilty and, and everybody knows they're guilty, they've committed a horrible crime and, and, and the, the sentence has passed, the judge has knocked down the gavel and says, hey, uh, you are going to jail, you are going to the death penalty for that crime. And, and we know that people, that happens all the time and they go to jail, but believe it or not, did you know there's a way for that person, even though they're guilty, to actually be set free from that crime? It's called a pardon. And the one in authority, the governor, has the part out of mercy, out of goodness, certainly nothing that that person did in jail. They can't undo the crime. It's too late. But out of mercy, the governor could go down there and grant that person in jail a full pardon for their crimes. And by receiving that pardon, the doors come open and they are set free and they're rescued from the death penalty. Folks, that's what God is doing every single day with us spiritually. He has allowed His Son, Jesus Christ, to take the death penalty in our place. He's pardoned us, but a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it. And it's actually been on historical record that there have been people on death row who a governor has gone down out of mercy and extends to them a full pardon, but they've rejected it. And by their own doing, they went to the death penalty. Folks, don't make that same mistake for all eternity. God loves you. He's willing to forgive you of anything and everything you've ever done. All of it. Even the sins we don't even know about. He wants to pardon you and forgive you, but you must receive that by faith today. The Bible says if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you call upon His name, ask Him to forgive you of all your sins, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the grave, you will be saved. Please do that now. Please do that today because tomorrow may be too late. Well, this has been Billy Crone of Get Life Ministries. Again, thank you for joining us. If there's anything that you need, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our information and number and uh, things will uh, pop up here on the screen here shortly. And remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. I want you to think of a time when you had control over your mind. Now think of a time when you let anything into your subconscious. Have we been led to a critical junction by unseen forces? What does this mean for the future of mankind? What have you been trained to believe about UFOs and aliens? Have you been deceived? Are you waiting for something to show up? In this groundbreaking documentary film, the veil will be lifted, your eyes will be open, as the truth is exposed like never before. We are not alone, but they are not what you think. Disclosure is near, so what will be the event? The one event that will fool the global population in the last days? Find out soon as we uncover the alien deception. Entertainment Frontlines. If you like our videos, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to get all our frequent updates.